Good morning friends, you are listening to NPTEL online lectures on Indian poetry in English and the lectures are being delivered by Binod Mishra. My dear friends, in the previous lectures you have already learnt how Indian poetry in English began and then the previous lecture we had started early modern poetry in English where we had discussed the poems of Nisim Ezekiel who is considered to be a master poet. And today we are going to talk about Jayant Mahapatra, another important figure without whom Indian English poetry seems to be incomplete. But before we look into the works of Jayant Mahapatra and we realize the poetic sparks that Mahapatra had created, it would be quite pertinent to know some, something about the poet, his background, the surroundings that he was in and also socio-political climate because it is always the socio-political climate that prompts a poet and of course propels him uh, not only to show his sparks but also allows him the weapon to face several challenges and to answer several challenges. The political condition that India had attained during the time of Mahapatra was an India which had already got its freedom. And as I have been saying that with freedom came not only many responsibilities but also several challenges which had to be faced. So it was a post-independent India especially of 1960s and 70s and after that when we had our own government own system the challenges that arose in the form of several political impediments which humanity had to test the bitterness of it. It was one such was emergency uh, in 1975 and then again terrorism as you may uh, many of you might be aware of and then there were several other tragic incidents like Bhopal gas tragedy and others which actually catapulted the minds of many poets and provided them a lot of substance for their poetry. It was a sort of atmosphere where it appeared that political interference was too much and that also led to a sort of intolerance and the poets also cannot remain unaffected by this. You already might have heard that there were many poets and creative writers who actually returned their awards and here I am reminded of Mahapatra also protesting against such sort of political uncertainties and he had returned Padmasri in 2015. So these were some of uh, the brief pieces of information but then who this Mahapatra was, how he started. So let us have a look at Mahapatra's early career. Uh, Jayant Mahapatra who actually became very famous uh, though too late because he started writing poetry in his 40s. I mean it is said that when he was 38 he began writing poetry. He was not like other uh, poets whom we have discussed uh, to whom these parts came uh, too early. So Mahapatra was born in 1928 in a pre-independent India. So he could see uh, both the phases of India, the pre-independent India and the independent India. Born in Katak of Orissa, Mahapatra's poetry is supposed to be steeped in uh, Orian culture, in Orian traditions. Uh, but then uh, that actually becomes a matter of debate as to whether Mahapatra should be confined or should be called only a traditional or a native or a regional poet. Right from the beginning of his life Mahapatra had seen several phases because his forefathers 
uh, even though they were Hindus, they had converted themselves to Christianity. So, it was only from the beginning that Mahapatra had to discover his own identity and he was living in an, in an age of conflict, uh, conflict not only inside but conflict outside as well. One thing which is very important to know about Mahapatra is that Mahapatra uh, basically was a physics teacher. He did his MSc in physics uh, and he served as a physics teacher in Ravinsa College, Katak. Uh, his education took him to several places, uh, but then once he started writing poetry and Mahapatra was a bilingual poet, he wrote in two languages, both in English as well as in uh, Oriya. Uh, but then majority of his poems are restricted to Orisha, the Orishan landscape uh, and, and the various problems that Orisha had seen uh, like say the famine, the poverty and uh, if one has a look at the entire corpus of uh, uh, Jayant Mahapatra, one could find that there were several issues uh, that Mahapatra has delineated in his poetry. Now, one thing which is once again very significant to note that Mahapatra is still uh, there and he is in his 90s, he is in his 90s. So, he can be considered to be a living legend. Uh, since he had throughout uh, been in Orissa uh, as a poet working in Ravinsa College from where he retired, he was very active and he continued writing. Even, even though, even, even though uh, age was on his uh, side, fine, but yet with ripening years, uh, Jayant Mahapatra also grew. He was also uh, editing a journal named uh, Chandravaga. He got several awards. Uh, he actually got Sahit Akadmi Award uh, in 1981 uh, and then uh, later on in uh, 2009, he got Padmasri, which he returned in 2015. Uh, now, Mahapatra, even though he started his career late, I mean uh, career as a poet, he started late, uh, but then he has got a good number of volumes, poetic volumes to his uh, uh, credit. So, here you can find the list of his uh, poetic works. He started with Close the Sky 10 by 10. And uh, it is said that his early poetry uh, was full of intellectualism. Uh, at several places, he has himself said that he was actually uh, trying to talk to his own self, uh, from the self to the other. That is actually a journey that one can witness in the poetic uh, uh, works of uh, Mahapatra. So, close the sky 10 by 10 is more willed by intellect than emotion. We can, we can find uh, Mahapatra's uh, poetry, even though uh, as uh, many critics and writers have said that it is steeped in past, but Mahapatra is the poet of silence and, and since science was uh, his background, so we can find there a conflict between silence and science, science and fiction, silence and noises and throughout you can find a beautiful delineation of all these. Uh, next to Kamwaj Swambara and other poems where there is a recurring vocabulary and it is said that words become concept uh, in the, in the uh, world of uh, Jayant Mahapatra and uh, then came reign of rights. This reign of rights, one must not confuse uh, that the reign of rights uh, talks about reigns, rather it, it, it actually talks about uh, the legions, uh, the history, uh, the myths and many more. Uh, rain is actually a symbol, you know, uh, poets have got symbols as a weapon and through symbols, uh, through symbols of uh, rain, he talks about fertility, he talks about uh, say uh, progress, he talks about destruction, he talks about the difficult, different, distinct times, he talks about the flowering, he talks about the harvest, I mean there are end number of things that he discusses because uh, with symbols, symbols actually provide him a sort of weak weapon to answer several challenges. Then comes in 1979, a uh, father's hours, then comes the waiting which actually talks about the conflict between the waiting of a child and the waiting of an adult. And how? Because Mahapatra himself had said uh, that poetry has to reveal, but when poetry has to reveal, I mean uh, when poetry has to reveal, it should not reveal in a way that it just becomes like prose. 
because through Mahapatra, uh, the opinion, uh, poetry should have a different language. And you will find when we discuss some of his poems, you will find how he violates, how he actually distinguishes uh, poetic language or literary language uh, from uh, the language of the common people. Then comes a relationship, which once again talks about myths, legends and history. Fine. Uh, there one can find a sort of inner conflict. At times it is seen that the journey from the outside to the inside and from the inside to the outside is also witnessed. Fine. So, the space of feeling, the inner space of feeling is what we can find. And then comes life science. Uh, it, it was actually relationship for which he got Sahit Academy Award in 1981. And then came life science where actually he talks about uh, sometimes he talks about poetry, sometimes he talks about how, what he really wants to say because at times he says what it is and what it is not. So, this journey can be considered to be a sort of poetic process. And then comes burden of waves and fruits, then whiteness of bones, the whiteness of bones again is very symbolical and it say it, it, it appears that the poet has grown from the innocence to experience where whiteness again once again is very symbolical because whiteness can refer to so many things because here he talks about whiteness of bones. I mean he talks about the utility and futility of life and behind this utility and futility of life also through symbols, he talks of several things uh, that we can find an echo and an inspiration of many modern day poets like Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot. Fine. We will come across some of the lines in order to uh, show you how Mahapatra has grown uh, from a poet of passion to a poet of performance to a poet of realization to a poet of extreme consciousness. That, that is what uh, Mahapatra's uh, fort is uh, a fort should be remembered for. Even though uh, there are very few poems you cannot where you cannot find uh, Mahapatra's confinement to a particular reason to a particular land. But then he talks of memories, he talks of guilt, he talks of suffering, he talks of poverty, he talks of uh, uh, the uh, plight and the miserable condition of uh, women. He also talks about uh, animals, birds and so many things and Orishan landscape has got a permanent place in the poetic world of Jayant Mahapatra. It is said. Uh, that Mahapatra was actually trying uh, to build a sort of bridge from the local to the universal, from the local to the global. Then comes Bare Face, which uh, came out in 2000 and then uh, Land, which uh, got uh, published in 2013. Now, as I have been telling that when a poet has got such a vast range, because Mahapatra cannot be confined, even though Past is a recurring theme in majority of his poems and at times we find because he says that poetry is a moment of isolation, poetry is a moment of silence, it is a moment of loneliness, it is a moment of emptiness by and, and at, at several places he has said once he has already written the words. Uh, because after you have written the words or composed the words, then only poetry has got no meaning. So, the major aim of poetry is actually to represent the voice of the unsaid, my dear friend. There is a sort of introspection, introspective preoccupation in majority of his poems, where uh, he, his, his, his poems range from historical to cultural and also to social themes. Uh, if, if time permits, I will take one or two uh, poems where I can show you how Mahapatra tries to distinguish uh, the uh, literary language from uh, the common man's language. Uh, Mahapatra's world, uh, to, to quote uh, one of uh, the poets who says uh, uh, that I had no speech but metaphors. And in Mahapatra's world also you can find uh, there is uh, abundance of metaphors, imageries, uh, rivers, sky, sea, crows, animals, birds. I mean quite a good number of imageries is there and then 
even many people have come to the extent of experiencing that Mahapatra's poetic world is very difficult and, and to that Mahapatra himself uh, says uh, that it is not easy, it is not quite easy uh, to write a poem because you know uh, poems actually take time and, uh, uh, and, and as uh, we all know uh, that poetry is a sort of recollected emotions in tranquility and that Mahapatra also follows. Uh, but then uh, Mahapatra is uh, not unaffected by, not unaffected by several challenges which Orissa had been a witness to. For example, uh, poverty, uh, poverty stricken and in majority of his poems you can also find a background of uh, Jagannath, I mean Puri where he mentions uh, the landscape of uh, uh, Puri, I mean uh, Lord Jagannath and then there he also talks about uh, several other details like beggars, lepers and all. So, in Mahapatra's world both princes and paupers they get space and that is very significant of Mahapatra my dear friends. Now, at times uh, his poems appear to be very vague, but then this vagueness is a quality there is a vagueness in poems, but then this vagueness provides his poetic world with a sort of Indian sensibility because he himself says uh, about uh, poetry as uh, I had been uh, sharing with you my dear friends, poems need to be revelatory, they should sow something that has not been sown before. I mean it is very easy uh, to sow what is there, but what Mahapatra says is that a poet should sow what has not been sown before. If it offers something new, either through images or through statements made, then the poem has possibly done what it was meant to. So, the aim of poetry is to sow what has not been seen. The poets, as we all say, that the poets have got the third eye, my dear friend. If you look at all the best poets we have had, they have always been a spiritual people spiritual people, they have always looked upwards, a good poem should lift you from the plane. So, when he says from the plane we live in, I mean he talks about the ordinary or uh, the commonplace experiences to be given a sort of super experience my dear friend. Uh, this expression has uh, to get a sort of significance, this mundane plane that we exist in now has got something a little higher, it is a sort of prayer poetry is a way of life, it is a sort of sadhana, it is a sort of penance, if it does not take us higher of what use is that poem. So, for those people who think that Mahapatra's world is very intricate, very difficult and, and uh, his uh, poems are also very difficult, many people are not able to understand. For them this is the answer when he says, if it does not take us higher, if a poem does not make you think what good use is a poem is because Mahapatra was a man of science, a man of physics. That is why the images which you will find my dear friend, the images are quite striking. It may remind us of a sort of uh, the wit, fine, of a sort of wit and conceit that many of us English lovers have found in the poetry of John Donne. Of course, we do not get so many surprises, but then we can get many striking images and these striking images actually hinge upon uh, wisdom uh, from cultural legacy. Of course, the poetic geography or the landscape is Puri and uh, that is why I would really, I cannot stop myself uh, from uh, taking up a poem uh, named Down at Puri. And once we see that poem and we there we will also find how Mahapatra is different and why Mahapatra is distinct as an Indian English poet my dear friend. He himself had said, uh, physics taught me to write with a consciousness, with a consciousness. Mahapatra cannot be considered simply to be a poet who actually sings of, sings of uh, romantic sparks and all. Mahapatra's uh, poetic world is full of pains, trials, tribulations and we are reminded of P.B. Selly who says, our sweetest songs are those that consist of our saddest thought. 
and Mahapatra's world is also suffused with pain my dear friend because without pain there cannot be a poetry that is what Mahapatra himself believes. He says that physics helped him gain a sort of consciousness not to use the unnecessary word that is why when we read Mahapatra's poems we will find that there is a sort of precision, there is a sort of conciseness. Words used are not difficult my dear friend, images may be difficult but then for that you will have to have some patience my dear friend. Of course, what Mahapatra believes is that one has to have a sort of imagination and it is only through imagination that you, we can meander through the sparks and furies sparks and furies uh, that can lead to ashes, asses in, in Mahapatra's world we find the use of asses too much, the ass which is burnt out of uh, which is which is the remnant of fire because Mahapatra believes that ultimately all our lives are towards the end it is but nothing. So, they one can find there are layers of interpretations uh, one when one roams or when one really steers through the world of Mahapatra. Mahapatra's imagination if we uh, take a quote by Sid Harrix who in ripening uh, wine says, Mahapatra's imagination is of the type that is Jungian or whatever in Indian more specifically Orishan equivalent of that may be. Many of his poems seem to be the result of a quest. This quest may be a sort of identity quest because he was a, a Christian convert. So, he was also trying to find out, he was also trying to have his own identity and those identity he is also trying to find through his poems, he is also trying to answer. Indicators of primordial pre-linguistic dream layered experiences, the legions and archetypes of a collective unconsciousness, collective unconsciousness. So, once you start uh, uh, through the world of Mahapatra you will find uh, that even though past is there, but past has been used as a sort of reminder uh, to the uh, new generation, to the upcoming generation of how we have left our traditions behind. My dear friend, my dear friends we all know uh, that any poet who compromises with tradition or who forsakes his tradition cannot be a good poet if we are reminded of what T.S. Eliot says. So, Mahapatra follows that and through the past he also tries to provide mankind a sort of relation. The grassroots of emotions, the ancestral lineaments of personal identity and this personal identity Mahapatra was actually trying to find. Now, let us take some poems in order to justify uh, what we have been saying about Mahapatra and in order also to testify what a great poet Mahapatra was. Now, here you can find the title of the poem is A Reign of Rights and it is from uh, that collection Reign of uh, uh, Rights where uh, if you uh, have a look at the uh, lines you will find that right from the beginning the poet actually takes a symbol as a weapon and then he makes a sort of soul searching. Let us uh, read the poem in order to uh, get uh, the uh, substance or the nuances of how the poet begins the journey of self discovery. Sometimes a rain comes slowly across the sky that turns upon its grey cloud breaking away into light before it reaches its objective. So, here rain is very symbolical, rain symbolizes here fertility creation. The rain I have known and traded all this life is thrown like kelp on the beach. This kelp is a sort of sea wood and he says uh, throughout the sort of rain I have experienced they are just like sea weeds. Like some shape of conscience I cannot look at a malignant purpose in a nun's eye. He here he talks about uh, the meaninglessness, uh, the fruitlessness of this life, the insignificance of this human life. Who was the last man on earth? Who was the last man on earth to whom the cold cloud brought the blood to his face? Numbly I climb to the mountain tops of ours, where my own soul quivers on the edge of answers. 
So I am, I am trying to seek several answers where my soul is searching. This search may be anything. This may be a search for identity. This may be a search for a sort of a spiritual journey. This may be a search for his roots, which is still stale air sits on an angel's wings, stale air, once again reminding us of our past, stale air sits on an angel's wings, what holds my rein, so it is hard to overcome. So, to me, why, what is, what is it that stoppeth me, what is it that restricts my rein, the rein of my life, the meaning of my life. So, this is the poet's question and this is not only the poet's question, even though we can say that the poet is actually trying to personalize it, but the poet tries to universalize it and all of us are in a reign of rights, all of us are in a reign of such identity, we are actually trying to discover such a sort of reign in our lives. Now, my dear friends, one of the most famous and one of the most popular poems uh, which have been prescribed in many universities, colleges, schools and all, that can actually give an inkling into the poetic corpus of Jaintha Mahapatra. The title of the poem is Down at Puri and while analyzing, I will try my level best to show how the poet actually tries to violate are the common rules are that the common people actually has in their psyche or in their knowledge. But then he takes a very common experience of a down at Puri. This is not the down that we had been talking about in Sabitri. This is a different down, a common down where the poet simply looks at and in his imaginative eye, then suddenly he is transported to a different world. Let me read the poem so that you can find out uh, the beautiful meaning which is uh, hidden or which has been transported in it. Now see, the poem begins, endless chronoages a skull in the holy sense, tilts it empty country towards hunger. The poet actually talks about hunger, but then there is a sea, then there is a down at the sea beach at Puri and the poet simply says what he finds, he finds endless crow noises. So, what is there? The crow noises and those crow noises endless my dear friend. See how the poem begins, the poem begins with an adjective and then comes the double nouns, the multiple nouns, compound nouns, endless chronoages. See, a skull in the holy sands, a skull, this skull is actually reminiscent of people who are already dead, our forefathers, tilts it empty country towards hunger. So, it is because of the hunger that we have lost many of our forefathers, many of our citizens, many of our near and dear ones and then what is there? The crow simply, uh, the crow is cowing and the cowing of the crow as also has got some symbolical meaning. So, the poet here makes use of symbol and the poet also makes, the poet also, you know, if we also analyze it stylistically, we will find the poet actually uh, tries to violate the common rules and the verb, the verb is in the third line, my dear friend. White clad widowed women past the centers of their lives are waiting to enter the great temple. And the poet also makes us aware of how the miserable condition of the white clad women, fine, those women who have already been widows, they are clothed in white and their only center is towards the temple, my dear friend. So, the temple also here stands as a sheltering ground for all those helpless people who have nobody to take care of. But here the poet says, white clad widowed women pass the centers of their lives. Again, he makes use of the verb uh, pass and he says past, he makes use of past participle. So, there the poet actually makes use of foregrounding as a linguistic device here and the poet actually tries to say the language of common man and the language of literary uh, and the language of literature is quite different. And then he says, their austere eyes, their austere eyes stare like those caught in a net, whose austere eyes? The austere eyes of these widowed women, 
though they, they appear to be caught, they appear to be trapped, hanging by the down signing strands of faith. And again, the down here, there is a personification, my dear friend, hanging by the down signing. Can the down sign? So, here is a reflection, uh, the morning sun comes uh, and then the lives of all these widowed women, they appear as if they have been caught and they appear hanging by the down signing strands of faith. The frail early light catches, the frail early, so double adjectives have been used ruined leprous cells leaning against one another, a mass of crouched faces without names, nameless people. My dear friends, it was uh, uh, said that when people uh, died, they could get salvation when uh, their funeral pyres were led by the seaside or the riverside or whatsoever. So, the poet is actually conscious of uh, the Indian reality and suddenly breaks out of my height. So, when I look at this, Suddenly what happens? Suddenly breaks out of my hide into the smoky blaze of a sullen solitary pyre. So, when I see this sullen solitary pyre near the seaside, then suddenly I am transported to and I am reminded of my own mother's wish and then in the next stanza the poet will say, her last wish to be cremated here, twisting uncertainly like light on the shifting sands. So, what the poet does? The poet actually looking at the down here, the poet has many things in his mind. The poet not only violates the standard English language, but since he is a poet, he has got this license. And then what the poet does? The poet not only makes use of double nouns, uh, he, he not only uh, makes use of adjectives, but then he also makes us aware of what is our tradition what our forefathers, what our mothers used to think of and that is, that is, that is what uh, the poet is actually reminded of, he is reminded of when he looks at this down, he is reminded of how his mother's last wish was to be cremated because all our forefathers wanted to get a sort of salvation through this uh, Swargadwar as, as, as they say. So, there is actually a sort of intensity of conflict and this conflict is also the conflict of the poet's own self and the from, from the poet's own self to the self of his own mother and the poet has also made use of hide which is used as a nine, noun, but the poet has actually uh, made its use as a verb. So, that is what makes this poem very beautiful my dear friend. If we make a proper thematic analysis of the poem, we can also get a lot of meanings as we have already discussed that even though the poet is discussing or delineating a landscape, uh, but then he through this local, he actually tries to universalize it according to the Indian tradition where the Oriya sensibility is actually the representative of Indian sensibility, all our forefathers wishing to be cremated uh, at Puri near the Swargdar. It is actually a conflict between faith and experience and when the poet says that endless crow noises, fine. So, on the one hand he talks about uh, this uh, landscape, on the one hand he talks about this picture, but on the other hand when he comes to the end he says uh, that the last wish of his own mother was to be cremated here. So, there is a sort of conflict between faith and experience and these images which the poet actually has provided here, they palpitate with life my dear friends. Now, as I have been saying that even though Mahapatra's world is steeped in past, Mahapatra is also affected by uh, the condition of the women. And in poem after poem he says, uh, there is actually a very famous poem which uh, you can uh, read up your, at your own disposal, a, a whorehouse in Calcutta where he talks about uh, the prostitute's pitiable condition and there he also takes a bite at the contemporary civilization. No, that how on the on, on one hand you think of these people polluting, but why can't you think of that these are the people who are also civilizing the world in a different way my dear friend. And then he also talks about 
in in missing person he talks about a woman who is also trying to search her own identity because of the confinements that she has and she can only look at her own features and trying to find out her own soul searching where he can she can simply find the yellow flames the yellow flames of the lamp which she is having where where her lonely body hides if you permit may i uh, i read the lines in order to make it uh, clear rather in the darkened room, a woman cannot find her reflection in the mirror. In the darkened room, so dark symbolizes this ignorance. Dark symbolizes the sort of tradition which actually has bolted the conscience of all these women. Her only conscience is alive, but the patriarchal system, what the patriarchal system has provided her, waiting as usual at the edge of sleep. In her hand, she holds the oil lamp whose drunken yellow flames know where her lonely body hides. So, where is she? What is her identity? So, in poem after poem, he also talks about the miserable plight of women. You can have uh, a look at this poem where uh, the uh, status of the women has been shown in a, in a, in a very intentionally, no? in, a, in a intentionally and in a very biting way where the poet says, where are the things called homes? Sticky with toil, need after need, tempts the fates to touch them, trap the homely, embarrassed heart. Look at the lines, look at the words. Are the words difficult? No. But these words are actually soaked in pain, hurt, embarrassed, sticky, fine, need after need year after year. Look at this stanza, how symbolical it is, but how beautifully and candidly it actually delineates the condition of women. Year after year, I mean repetitive, like onions and herbs hung out to dry, their hearts heavy, the quiet too long, silence. Uh, they have been silenced, they do not have a voice of their own, fine their hearts heavy, the quiet too long, what do they live for? What is the meaning and significance of life for them when their lips are tight and when they are only uh, waiting on the edges of the sleep? What do they live for? And then in a very typical one-liner, the poet says, they seed though. I mean, see how the poet actually takes a dig that these women who are considered to be are the mother of civilization after civilization. They have actually been silenced, but they have simply uh, been allowed to have their sustenance only because why? They seed though. Those who are the creators, they actually have been put to silence. They do not have their identity of their own my difference. Now, you also come across several, you know, several attacks on the poetic world of Mahapatra, where many people say that Mahapatra's poetic world is too intricate, too difficult and is confined only to Oriya, only to Orian landscape. In defense of his own art, what Mahapatra says is an eye opener. What he says is, these images have made my life. It is the land that has made me and in turn shaped my poetry. So, yes, I am intimate with the land. I could not have lived elsewhere. I could not have lived elsewhere, nor could I have written poetry anywhere else. So, Mahapatra is not assamed. Uh, when somebody calls his poetry to be stripped only in a particular landscape and only in a particular reason, he is rather proud and he says that I could not have written had I lived elsewhere. And then to this land, to this land Orissa, he says, to this land in which my roots lie my past and which lies my beginning and my end, where the wind keens over the great grief of the river Daya and where the waves of the Bay of Bengal fail to reach out today to the twilight and soul of Konarka, I acknowledge my relationship, fine. So, he makes a very candid confession and as I have been saying that he is not only a poet of guilt, 
a poet of confession, but he is also a poet who actually is proud of his own landscape, his own land. And about his poetry, because many people you, you uh, might have yourself experienced that Mahapatra's uh, vocabulary is very simple, even though the imagery is uh, difficult. But then what he says is, what huge is a poem if it is easily understood? Those people who consider his poem difficult, to them uh, it, it is uh, a very pertinent answer. What use is a poem if it is easily understood? If there is a straightforward working of the words, more in the manner of a statement, True poetry perhaps has always lent itself to an indirect approach. You remember what he said, what has not been sown has to be sown and that should actually be the aim of poetry. And he rightly says, good poetry has always lent itself to an indirect approach and where one wants to return to an overwhelming silence, it becomes difficult to explain such processes which take place in the mind. So, Mahapatra is uh, very clear uh, in terms of his art, in terms of his association with a particular landscape with a particular reason. So, having looked at two or three small poems, now you can create your own impression of Mahapatra and here a sort of conclusion that we can draw, but you are free to make your own conclusions. But my only request is while reading Mahapatra, please have some patience so that you can get the proper meaning. Because poetry according to Mahapatra is not a straightforward, poetry has to be indirect. So, Mahapatra's earlier poems where he has uh, talked about uh, the atrocities on women, the rapes of women, of little girl being sold day and night and whatsoever and then because of poverty and he himself is a case in point how his uh, own religion uh, was converted from Hindu uh, to uh, Christianity. So, his early poems are actually strains of love and passion, but then as a poet Mahapatra has grown after 70s where we find pain to be a sort of recurrent theme of his poems. Poem, uh, poems after poems you can find they are replete with pain and pain is uh, a sort of integral theme in his. Actually it is his pain that links his poetry to Indian reality because Indian reality is not about uh, the skyscrapers and whatsoever we are witnessing today. So, Mahapatra has very beautifully presented Indian reality without any hiding or without any pretext. So, that, that makes him and rightly has, uh, uh, has Bilas Sarang said that of all the Indian English poets, it is Mahapatra who is a true Indian poet because he believes that uh, we should not seek inspiration from others, rather we should seek inspiration from our own culture, from our own myth, from our own legion, from our own history. Because our history is replete with examples, be it of the holy scriptures and whatsoever. So, you one can find in the world of Mahapatra uh, a, a quite a great range right from a child's pain to a woman's to a woman's plight uh, to uh, the beggars and the lepers who for whom uh, the temple is a sheltering ground and for the widows too as you have yourself uh, uh, my, my experienced. So, the relationship of the self to the other is also a very dominant theme in Mahapatra and relationship with his ambience. No poet can be a great poet if he has not been able to be affected uh, with the ambience that he is living in. Uh, Mahapatra has rightly said uh, that poetry is actually a journey from the understandable to the ununderstandable, meaning thereby what it is and what it is not. So, my dear friend, having discussed Mahapatra's uh, uh, poetic world, we can come to the conclusion that Mahapatra is in true sense a great Indian English poet without whom uh, the world of Indian English poetry uh, could not have been possible and that is why Mahapatra has been prescribed 
in all the major institutions, not only of India, but at certain places uh, abroad as well. So, before we come uh, to end this talk, uh, let me quote once again some lines from Mahapatra's uh, uh, volume Life Science, where he says and where he talks about poetry and where he talks about the helplessness of poetry and the helplessness of human beings by saying, all this naked knowledge makes me tremble, defeated as I am by my own tactics. So, my poetry, by the words I measure my pain, again pain, by the words I measure my pain, the ceremony I make of every date on the calendar. And with this, we come to the end of today's talk. Uh, here we find not only the impressions of Buddha, not only the impressions of Gandhi, not only the impressions of Christ, because entire life is actually replete with pain and a true sadhak can get something new only out of the pain, only out of the penance, only out of the suffering. After suffering only, there is a new tomorrow. And for you also, there will be a new tomorrow when I come up with a new lecture and the new lecture will be on once again another significant voice and that is Keki and Daruwala. Till then, thank you very much. I wish you all a good day ahead. Thank you.